You had a question on that? You speak louder. Somebody right? has like a passion and interest in philosophy. Would you be pro or against um, majoring in philosophy or getting a PhD in it? Um, and if yes, like is there anything you should be aware of? Or like aware of? Okay. Someone has a passion and interest in philosophy. Should he major in it? Should he get a PhD in it? Or something to be aware of? Um, first of all, you're very unlikely to make enough of money with a PhD in philosophy to live the style of life you want to live. Um, if you want to be practical about have, making a living, I would not recommend it as a, uh, you know, you're not going to be teaching at Princeton. So uh, uh, you'll be at some community college somewhere probably and you'll have to live in the sticks somewhere and it won't, it won't, be, it won't be easy. But what, number two, um, philosophy is a complicated subject and it's very easy to take three or four courses and get uh, a lick of this and a lick of that and think you know what you're talking about and get everything wrong. Uh, I'm prejudiced because I'm a specialist and I, I know how easy it is to get things wrong and not know, I have no clue that you're getting things wrong. So uh, unless you're going to become a specialist, you have to realize that you'll be learning things which probably uh, very likely are wrong. Now, the truth is that that problem is much more widespread. If you consider how much was taught, what was taught in universities 100 years ago, and how much of it is still taught, you'll see right away that a lot of what is being taught in universities is false. Unless you think we've finally arrived at the truth. 100 years from now, it's all going to be the same, but that's very unlikely. <clears throat> so whatever you learn, you're learning things that are false. The question is whether uh, how dangerous it is to learn about things that are false in terms of your way you, the way you live life, your life and what your values are. If, was Pluto really the ninth planet in the solar system? It was taught that way for a month, for, for decades, and all of a sudden it wasn't. Uh, were Newton's laws right? Well, no, they were always wrong. And just for hundreds of years, they thought that he had the final truth about the universe and turned out to be all wrong. So um, that's not so damaging. So what? But in philosophy, thank you very much, you're taught that uh, on one side, there's no such thing as real ethics or that uh, belief in a God is, is irrational so and so on. And you don't hear the other side of the argument. You don't realize where these people are coming from, how limited what they say is. Then you can have really serious consequences, really serious negative consequences. So, and because you have no background, you no standard of comparison, Inevitably, what you say is, oh, well, it sounds good to me, so it must be right. Probably what you should say is, if it sounds good to me, that's a good reason to think it's wrong, because I'm, being, I'm so ignorant in the subject that uh, you know, some, something's being missed. I remember when I uh, first read a certain sefer by, was uh, titled as by the Ramchal, and I was thrilled with it. Every paragraph where I had a question, the next paragraph, he asked my question. And he went, I went to someone who was a really specialist in Ramchal, he said, the very fact that you asked the question, he answered the next paragraph, proves Ramchal did not write it. He's writing on a much lower level, a much more simplistic level. Ham's writing, you have to struggle to understand. Oh, uh, I, I, I had the exact wrong impression because I wasn't familiar enough with the literature. So I can't, uh, I, I can't, uh, I can't really recommend it. If, if, I, if you were to want to want to get some impression of philosophy, which wouldn't be terribly misleading, there's a wonderful resource called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, free online, run by the Stanford University Philosophy Department, and it's an encyclopedia. And they do a very good job. They take a subject area, and they describe the problems in the area, and they describe the five competing going theories to find leading theories, leaving out seven or eight other theories. And then it talks about the difficulties with each one and the weakness with each one. And they end with hopes for future research. And then you know that whatever you learned is not going to be the last word because most people disagree with anything you read. The majority of philosophies are against anything you read in philosophy because there are five different theories. So you get the, if you get that impression, then you've gotten somewhere that could be not desperately misleading. That's to mean you'll understand the five theories that you read, but 
at least you have a picture of, of the real state of the state of the art. I use philosophy this way. Someone tells me that the position I'm taking is ruled out by modern thought, ruled out by modern research, ruled out by modern findings. I look up the philosophers who agree with me, and I say, well, they're modern, they're thinkers, and they agree with me. That doesn't mean I'm right. But it means I'm not ruled out. I'm, I'm making a very weak point. You just can't rule me out because I'm out of touch with what the modern world knows. The modern world doesn't know that because there's some people who disagree. But that's a very weak position to take. That thing, that position, I think I can verify. Uh, anyway, I, I would not, uh, I would not be very enthusiastic about it. If you wanted to do an undergraduate degree in philosophy and then become a lawyer, uh, law schools like that. But then after, you hopefully you'll have had enough experience to realize how little you know. And the Greeks used to say you should know everything about something and something about everything. And that's a very, I, mean, I see a sort of Michonne most of a very profound thing because you need to have a broad knowledge of what's going on to know what the various issues are, what the various questions are that, that are facing people. And you need to be an, an expert in one thing so you know what expertise is. And then you know what you lack in all the other subjects. And then you know what you have to go to an expert in that subject to get an opinion without just shooting off what happens to uh, appeal to you at the, off the top of your head. So, uh, the same thing is true of philosophy. Yeah? My question is how did Adam, Arishan, spend the first Shabbos of creation? Is there any... How did Adam the first, spend the first Shabbos of creation? It's a very difficult qu question. I think there are a variety of opinions. When he was expelled from the Garden of Eden, there are those, some who say that the light of Friday lasted all the way through Friday night and Shabbos, 36 hours of continuous light. Um, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to say. And, and, and it's very, it has to, it would have to be paired off with what should have happened had he succeeded and what happened instead. Because what happens is this happened instead of that. And that tells you what the significance of it is. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. I, I don't know. I don't know well enough to answer you. Yeah. Um, I guess this is going back to maybe I'm not sure what this question was, but career and doing different things. Um, how important is it to do what you feel in your heart that you are connected to, love, purpose, passion, whatever you want to call it, versus chasing practically or not chasing, but money and balancing those those two. Um, I guess those two mindsets. Uh, let me see if I understand you. you, you you're asking between choosing like a profession or something on the basis of what you love to do in your heart yeah. versus being practical about how you can earn a living and so on and so on. Right, like people say, no, money's good here, go do this. Um, I think that what you prefer to do, what you find meaningful, what you find um, significant and important is a very important factor. Because if you're like the vast majority of people, you're going to spend an enormous percentage of your life working. If you're working on something that you are bored by, you find uninteresting, you're doing it just for the money, that will have an effect on your personality, have an effect on your character. Um, it, it leads to distortions if you're bored by what you do and you don't feel self-worth because of what you do, you just do it for the buck. <coughs> become a different kind of person from the kind of person that who, who feels that what he's doing is important, that's significant. Now, it is very important to be practical. So what you want to do is try to find a way in which the thing that you find significant can be put to practical use. So, um, as I mentioned to him, if you want to get a degree in philosophy and become a lawyer, you've learned the philosophy. Philosophy will teach you some things that you can apply. You can continue to read in it and, and, and enjoy it. Um, but being a lawyer will mean that you'll be able to earn a living. And law has uh, at least 100 different applications, some of which would require some type of philosophical thinking. So you could probably work it in that way as a secondary effect. But to do something just for the money, you know, I, I have actually met uh, bus drivers who say, Everything depends upon me because people have to be where they can work.
people have to be where they can do the things that need to be done. Without transportation, everything grinds to a halt and the society falls apart. I'm providing the glue that makes the society work. That's a person who can walk, walk into the bus in the morning and feel, I'm doing something. This is one of the things, I don't have that much respect for kibbutzim, but this is one of the things in the kibbutz which I, I did really admire. Everyone who works in the kibbutz is made to feel that he's making an honest contribution to the success of the kibbutz, whether he's a kibbutz economist or whether he's the one who uh, harvests the apples from the, from, the, from the apple tree. All of it needs to be done for the kibbutz to be a success. People should feel, and this has lo lo lots of, uh, you know, all right, well, I'll skip that. But anyway, I do think it's important to do something that you, I told my students at university, the biggest gift you'll have in university is that you'll be able to choose something to work at that you will enjoy you and identify with. That's the biggest gift a university gives a person. So I think it's an important thing to say. But I would say one more thing. Don't confuse how much you enjoy studying with the subject, studying the subject with how much you'll enjoy working in the profession. I've met people for whom that was a bit of disappointment. They loved to study when they came out and faced the realities of the profession. They were very disappointed. And they, and they, and they switched professions. They couldn't, they couldn't take it. Talk to people who are working in the profession. Do an apprenticeship. You know, you know, uh, visit them in their offices and see what they do. But you won't have that, uh, that mistaken feeling that the subject is interesting. But I had jolts when I became a university professor, some of the things I saw go on among the professors was really pretty bitter. It was not the, the school of Aristotle, you know, pursuing the, the, the highest thoughts. It was, it was a lot of politics and backbiting and stabbing, and, and stabbing people in the back. And I, I, was, I was very disappointed about some of the things I saw. There. Yeah? Can it be like right or wrong without a god? Saying, like, let's just pretend God doesn't exist. Does the rabbi think there could be right and wrong? Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, there is no good reason to think there can't be. Um, let me just give you a tiny bit of background. Anyone who takes a position has to have a reason why he takes it. Some reason to, good reason to think that what he's saying is true. There's no default position. Some people say, well, if I don't have a good reason to think that right and wrong are, uh, can be uh, um, uh, established without a God, then God is necessary. No, maybe we won't have a good reason to think God is necessary either. Each side needs a good There's no default position here. Uh, you ask me whether there could be, I don't know of any good reason that says no. Lots of people think there are, but they're wrong. Um, what about the fact that like, maybe you just can't think of any reason why there should be? by the fact that I can't think of a reason why there should be right or wrong. Means that you can't think of one. That's all it means. It doesn't mean there isn't one. You don't really think that you contain all knowledge that there is right now, do you? I hope not, right? And uh, for thousands of years, no one could think of a reason why the stars shine. That doesn't mean they don't shine. It doesn't mean there isn't a reason why they shine. Right. It's just they couldn't think of it. So the fact that we don't have one doesn't mean that there isn't one. That's gigantic, gigantic chutzpah and gaiva. <laughs> Think if we don't have it; it doesn't exist. Um, the the uh, philosophical profession which deals with with ethics and morality, the vast majority have not simply given up because they're atheists. They're looking for objective bases for for uh, for ethics, and there are some that have been put forward and are argued seriously. And it's not clear that they're wrong. So I think it's at, at least it's an open question. I also think that there's a way of enforcing certain extreme limits. I've argued this in, in detail and, and it's recorded, but I, uh, let me just say uh, like two minutes worth. Um, there's a limit to credible disagreement. Did you ever have the experience of speaking to someone about something and then suddenly thinking, I must not be understanding him. What do you mean by good? What do you mean by real? What do you mean by just? What do you mean by intelligent? Because he said something that's so obviously wrong, and he's an intelligent person, so I must not be getting him. So you stop and ask him what he means by his words. Everybody has that, that, uh, that experience. 
That experience comes from the following thought. I'm talking to a person who I know is intelligent, I know he's serious, and he says, says something which to me is ridiculous. Well, that means I don't understand him. The reason I don't understand him is probably because he's using a word differently from the way I use the word. Okay, so now um, someone says, well, different cultures have different values, different standards, and there's no limit. You know, who's to, to tell them what standards they should have? Well, suppose that the way it's described, the standard that they're supposed to be accepting is an obviously wrong standard. Then the right thing to say is we can't be understanding them because they're not unintelligent. They wouldn't be making a stupid mistake as, as that. That's just a limit to how far you can go. So things that are very obvious about morality, like torturing small children for fun is wrong, for fun is very important. Um, someone says, but in this culture, torturing for, uh, small children for fun is right. I say, is right torturing small? Something you got wrong, because it isn't right. It's wrong. It's obviously wrong. So if they say words that you interpret as meaning that it's right, you're not interpreting their words correctly. We don't tolerate that kind of, of disagreement in any area of life. So I think that that sets certain limits in, in objective terms. And somebody says to me, you're, you're just imposing your culture on them. I say, on the contrary, you and I are discussing in English how to use English to describe their thoughts, their thoughts and their principles and their, and their, and their understanding of the world. Well, if we're doing it in English, then English is the language we're speaking. And English has the, the concepts that it has. And you have to respect those concepts. Otherwise, don't talk. So that if English sets limits to how far the concept can go, that's the limit of that concept. You could say they don't use our concept, that's fine. They, they don't care about what we call morality, they care about something else. Imagine that you translate them as saying, justice is whatever the chief says. No, that's not what justice is. You might just well say justice is marshmallows. Right? You're not going to tolerate that, are, are you? In that culture, justice is marshmallows. And here it's paying people equal way, equal pay for equal work. That's not a candidate for justice. Maybe they mean delicious dessert. They don't mean what we call justice. Okay, uh, that's just a little bit of background. Yeah. Besides for the halakhic requirements of dress, could you explain uh, some of the meaning of modesty, sneers? Like the okay. essence of it? Besides from the halakhic requirements for dress, what about modesty? What is modesty? Uh, first of all, the, the verse that describes modesty says nothing particular about women. is a verse that applies to both men and women. Maybe the word modesty is hard to define and understand. Maybe the word privacy is better. Not everything's on display. That doesn't only mean your skin. It also means your behavior. You don't attract attention to yourself. Um, there's a passage in Derek Eretz Zuta where it says, when people are standing, don't sit. When people are sitting, don't stand. When people are laughing, don't cry. When people are crying, don't laugh. Don't call attention to yourself. Now, there might be a reason why you have to be different. You see the fire and nobody else sees it. Fire, get out! But there has to be a reason. Otherwise, don't be different from other people. Um, don't, uh, that means the way you talk, the way you walk. Um, there was a time, I mean, this was 40 years ago, when very long dresses for women came in. Right, so some people said, oh, look at that, Baruch Hashem. Now they'll be covered up. Some of the rabbis asked them because no one else is wearing them. So when you wear it, boy, oh boy, the head's turned. Look at that, look what she's wearing. That's not the point of it. The point is not to cover your skin and attract attention so everybody's looking at you. That's not the, that wasn't the point of it. It's a question of modesty, of, of, of privacy. Now, one thing this is designed to make you think is, to what extent do I live for my public image? How many likes did you get? How many friends do you have? Zero! None of them are friends. They just push the friend button? That's a friend? Could you call them up and ask them for money if you were in trouble? No, hey, that's not friendship. So how much am I living for my public image? And if you, how much, is there anything of you? You know, on these 
the stupid social media. I just bought a can of milk. Here's a picture of it, you know. I'm going to take it home and, you know, <laughs> to such people, I say, get a life <laughs> and don't live on Instagram. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So I, I, I think that the sense of privacy, the sense, your relationship with God ultimately is private. Ultimately is private because it involves the heart and the mind and, and every aspect of your being. And if you share your life with someone, there'll be a limit to how much you can express some things that can't be put in words. Um, I, I think it's, that's, the, that's the driving idea behind it. And if a person finds it irksome to uh, restrict himself in this way, then he has to think caref carefully about his identity and his values, what he's living for, and try to learn the lesson that the, well, your image in the public eye is not something which should be guiding the whole of your life. Rava says in the Gemara that a, a rabbi living in a community, if everybody likes him, something's wrong. Because if he's going to have standards, he's going to give orders to people, he's going to fight for justice, so on and so on, some people are not going to like him. That's the way it is. Yeah, what's we'll not? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll tell you briefly. There's a wonderful book called The Dynamics of Dispute by Rabbi Tzvi Lampel. He has a whole chapter on this. Elu Elu. These and these are the words of the living God. Now, um, there are two things to say here. I mean, a lot, this needs more elaboration, and this is only Q&A, but there are two things to say here. First of all, there are many commentaries on those words. Not one says that both sides of a contradiction are true, not one. And when you discuss a statement in the Talmud, here's what often happens. The Talmud says X, Y, Z, and you're talking, you're talking, and arguing back and forth, and you say, really it means ABC, because it's simpler, it's clearer, it's shorter. So you switch the words into ABC, and then you're talking about ABC, and you don't stop to ask yourself, if really what they meant was ABC, why didn't they say ABC? Why did they say X, Y, Z? You know, after all, maybe they meant what they said. So you start with these and these are the words of the living God, and you switch over to both sides are true, and how can they both be true? It's a contradiction, maybe it's beyond logic, maybe God isn't bound by logic, da 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 the whole song and dance, right? And you don't stop and ask, but Chazal didn't say they're both true. They said, these and these are the words of the living God. That's much vaguer, much more difficult to understand than they're both true. So why did they say that? Because they didn't mean they're both true. Now you look into the commentaries, you see, for example, the Ritva, and Erevin says that God gave to Moses for every issue, 49 reasons on this side, 49 reasons on that side. When you say Elu Elu means all the reasons are genuine reasons because God certified all the reasons, but he didn't give the decision. And you pass the decision. And on that, Elu Elu isn't said on the decision. Rashi and Ksuba says a similar thing. That when you have a discussion among the rabbis and they bring proofs to their positions, every one of the proofs that they bring is a genuine piece of Torah. So the, the materials used in the argument are all, these and these are words of the living God, but not the, not the conclusion. The Maharal says it only refers to Hill and Shammai. Rabbi says that uh, in every item in the world, only God is one. Absolute simplicity. No compound, no, comp no, uh, no uh, com combinations, no different dimensions. Only God is singular. Everything else is complex. As you're having a discussion whether something is tummy or tar, defiled or, or pure, in this object there is both tum and tar. Both of them are there. It's not single, it's not homogenous, but one side is dominant. So when one person looks at it and says it's Tame, he's seeing a reality. There is Tuma there. When another person looks at it and says it's Tohar, he's seeing reality because there is Tara there. The Psaq should go with the majority. In one case, it was equal, 50-50. That's Hill and Shame. Just Hill and Shame, says, says Maharal. There the Psaq could go either way because it's equally true. That's what Eilu Eilu goes on. Just that, but nothing else. Nobody says that to uh, two sides of a, of a contradiction are, are true. And this is a, a, a guidepost. We're talking about Chazal. Pay attention to the words. Don't let it slip over in your mind. 
כל מי שאומר שדוד לוחות אל אינו אלא טועה. anybody who says that David didn't sin is making a mistake. He didn't sin? How could you say he didn't sin? Anavi, the prophet knows, comes to him and says, you're the one who sinned, he says, I sinned. How could you say he didn't sin? But think, they didn't say he didn't sin. They said, anybody who says he didn't sin, uh, 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 anybody who says that uh, uh, he sinned is making a mistake. That's much longer, it's more complicated. Just say he didn't sin. They don't mean he didn't sin. What they mean is, you think, you know what the sin is, you're going to be wrong. You don't understand him well enough, you don't understand the Torah well enough to appreciate what his sin was. Pay very, very attention, attention to the words. There are many, many examples of this. Yeah. So when the people was counted in the desert or in the different situations where the Jewish people were counted, um, there's a range of, of age, which is the number that is counted. But what happens with all the people, the rest of the people? I don't know, I mean, I guess you'd have to ask what the purpose of counting is. I mean, they're not doing a census. And this is not like, you know, when the United States does a census every 10 years, and they divide people up and everything else. You know, if you're breathing, then you count. <laughs> they're counting people who are responsible for what the actions of the, of the, of the community, and people who are, um, involved in communal, communal responsibility. Tzava, which in modern Hebrew means army, does not mean army in the Torah. The Le Levites, when they go out to serve in the, in the tabernacle, they call it Tzava. Tzava just means a group of people who are acting together. Uh, these are people, Yotz Eit Tzava, means that when there are things that need to be done on the sake of the community, from 20 and up, that's when, that, that's when they were responsible to do that. Younger, they weren't responsible to do that. Uh, there are people who are carrying the identity of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the community. Below that are still incompetents, people who are in training. And by the Levites, by the way, it goes not from, from 20 and up, but from, from uh, a month and up. So it's a different count because they have a different, a different set of responsibilities. Uh, not, not uniform. But I, I, uh, there's no starting point to say, well, why didn't they count the other? Why should they? Well, what, what does it count for? The, you know, the count is not just a, a census, but that's not what's going on. Their, their image of themselves that they're projecting. Or, or another example would be, say, in watching a, a movie. So besides for the, and they show an intimate uh, scene with the, with the couple. So besides for the question of um, pretus, is there an element of viewing things that are, viewing things that are private that are not meant to be seen, even if I'm not um, showcasing my own life? Well, now, this is a little, a little, I mean, I, I sort of hear the question, but all the examples you gave don't fit the question. You're asking whether the other side of modesty, that is viewing what people do, has, has a problematic. Now, what you would say is, is it appropriate for me to view things that are meant to be private? But everything on all those social media accounts and everything in those movies is meant to be seen. It's put up in order to be seen. They want it to be seen. In the movies, they even pay to see it. So you're certainly not viewing something that's not meant to be seen. It's wrong of them to be exposing themselves this way. They mean it to be public. It is, however, wrong for them to be doing so. Okay, but that's, well, that's a different question. That's not what you asked before. Okay. So now, let's see. They're exposing themselves in a way that's wrong. Very interesting question. They're exposing themselves in a way that's wrong. And... The observer is observing something that they shouldn't have exposed. Is there anything wrong with the observer? Let's talk, let's take someone who's talking in too loud a voice. There's no reason for him to crawl attention to himself that way. It's also a failure of, 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 of sneers, of honesty. Now, must I, thank you very much, must I not listen because he shouldn't be exposing himself in that way. 
You see, it's not a question of something that needs to be kept private necessarily. You can call attention to yourself by doing something which isn't inherently meant to keep to be private. You know, your views on, on a subject, and you and you're uh, enforcing your uh, you grab the attention of people in a way that that's not modest. Nothing wrong with it, with it, publicizing your views on a subject. The question is how you do it. If you write a book and offer it for sale, that's fine. People decide whether to buy the book or not buy the book, right? So it's not, it's not as if when modesty says don't, don't expose this, therefore the this is something that should be hidden. That doesn't follow. What, what, what follows is that you shouldn't be calling attention to yourself in this particular way. Nowadays, it's very popular to say One second, so, so, then, so then here, in, in certain cases, you could you could see it this way: by your paying attention, you're feeding this bad meter in him. You're feeding this bad character trait in him. He wants to attract attention. He shouldn't be wanting to attract attention. You give him attention, so you're reinforcing his his activity of, of attracting attention. That could be a problem. That could be a reason not to do it. Nowadays, it's very popular that there are podcasts of people sharing very, uh, being very open about their lives, let's say, and they share very intimate. If I'm if I'm consuming those things, so that that fit in, in what you're saying? I don't know. It's a, I think there's a subtlety here that I'm, I'm probably not sensitive to. Um, I struggled with my relationship with my father. That's private and so forth and so on. He writes a book about how he struggled and how he, and so forth and so on. Should he not reveal that? I don't know. I'm not sure that uh, something wrong with revealing that. Maybe someone could learn from his experience and improve his life from doing that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think there are subtleties here that I'm not getting. I'm not. I don't have a feeling for the question. I don't have a feeling for the for the subject area. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. So uh, Shem gave us free choice. Right? Are we allowed to ask him for signs? Asking for what? For signs. Uh, it's very tricky. It's very tricky, Ken. He gave us, but I don't see what the two, two things have to do with one another. He said, he gave, he gave us free choice. Can we ask him for signs? Because like, we're meant to choose our own free will. But if we're asking him for a sign, it's like, and he does give us, let's say, it's like making us go one way. When oh, that's what you mean. I said, okay, I, I misunderstood your question altogether. He is asking like this. <laughs> if he gave us free will, to ask him for a sign is like giving up free will because then he's the one who's telling us how to go. Yeah. That's absolutely not correct. That's absolutely not correct. You're using your free will to ask. That's what you're using it for. Sure. It's like going to an expert. Of course you go to an expert. No, I have to make my own decision. Otherwise, not my free will. I'm just doing what the expert said. Yeah. Your free will to use responsibly is to go to the expert and do what he says. That's what your free will should, should tell you to do. So I said, there's no compromise there at all. Not at all. I mean, the Torah is full of instructions, right? Forget about asking him for a sign. How about looking it up in the Shulchan Aruch, right, in the Code of Jewish Law, and it says, oh, in your condition, this is what you should do. That would be similar, that would be the same, the same kind of, of uh, compromise according to your question. Not at all. Not at all. It's like without reading something and knowing the information, but like being in a situation like you're outside, you need to, you don't know what to do. And you literally like, you're But now you're not asking the same question. That's what I thought you were asking before. You're asking about whether you can ask God for signs as his, a sign of his will as to what you should do. That, that's not a contradiction to free will at all. The question now is, what, how, what's the kosher way to get information from a Kodesh Baruch This is very tricky when Eliezer is sent to get a wife for, for, um, for Yitzchak. And he's standing by the well, and the girls are coming out to the well. And he asks God for a sign. <coughs> now, the, the word by Omar, that these, the, the words that he said, has a trump, a musical note. This musical note appears only four times in the entire Torah. And it is, shall shall us, a very long and complex note. And it always connotes hesitation, kind of hesitation, inner conflict. And like Umar says, he was on the borderline of forbidden signs. And in fact, it's a disagreement in the Gemara, whether he did right or did wrong. And he knew he was on the borderline, and that's why he hesitated. So sometimes signs are okay, and sometimes they aren't, and it's context-dependent, and also person-dependent. I don't think there's a general rule. 
I don't think there's a general rule. <laughs> yeah. In your book, you write that you don't believe Pascal's wager is like a good argument. Uh, you didn't write why. Okay, I'll, I'll do this very quickly if I can. Pascal was a great mathematician, and also he was a very pious Christian. And he created a wager in favor of believing in Christianity. And the wager goes like this. When you have options um, and you're trying to decide what to do, you take into account two features. Uh, first of all, the option is based on the world being one way or another. So the question is, how is the world and what does your information tell you? Which way is more probable that that is true about the world? And second of all, if you do what you do, what's the payoff? So what you do is you, th you take the payoff and you modify it by how probable it is that you'll get the payoff. Now suppose somebody offers you an infinite payoff. Infinite. Well then no matter how low the probability is, the, expect the expected gain is infinite. So you should surely choose that one no matter how low the probability is. So he said, don't bother me with evidence. Don't bother me with reason. Don't bother me with probability. Any option that offers you an infinite payoff, that's the option that you should choose. That's based on what's called decision theory. Of course, Christianity, he said, offers an infinite payoff. And he's fighting with the secularist who doesn't want to believe. And he says, and nothing in the secular world could offer you an infinite payoff. So therefore, if it's a choice between being a non-believer and being a Christian, logic would tell you that you should be a Christian. That was his argument. Well, there, there are several things wrong with that. First of all, Christianity is not the only option that offers an infinite payoff. Other religions could offer an infinite payoff also, and then this, this reasoning doesn't give you any reason to choose one religion as, uh, uh, as, against another religion. That's well known in the literature. I have another objection. I think that the secular person might ha offer an infinite payoff also without having a belief in God, because he can say that there are certain things that are so wrong they just shouldn't be done under any conditions. And for example, he'll say, if the Torah isn't true, God forbid, if there is no God, killing someone for violating Shabbos is absolutely wrong. You're killing an innocent person on the basis of a false belief, that's absolutely wrong. And no money could offset it, and no health system could offset it, you're killing an innocent person. So he can also believe in infinite value. After all, these, uh, this is just technical, but in decision theory, the values are subjective. They're what you value and how much you value it. It's not objective. So I, I think that that's another reason why Pascal's wager is not, uh, is not applicable. That's why I don't use it. I wrote in my book that I don't use it. In earlier versions, I put it in, I put the reasoning in and everything else. People said to me, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody's interested in that. But those, those are the two reasons why I don't use it. Yeah, what's <coughs> Yeah. Another question. Um, if someone's considering um, marrying a girl who's less religious than him, but is willing to, uh, let's say, for example, let's say he wants her to cover her hair, but she doesn't, but she's willing to, like, do the things he wants, um, but, like, she doesn't actually, you know, she's not at the same level as him. Is that, do you think they should not get married? That's a very interesting question. Suppose uh, uh, you're speaking from the man's point of view. Usually it works the other way. All right. Uh, marry a girl who uh, doesn't fully believe and is not fully committed, but she'll do things for him. Um, I think it depends a lot on where she's holding. Is she in a process of developing? Is she looking to develop? Is she... Uh, pacing herself because she knows how much change she can take, but she's looking forward five years down the line to being fully compliant. She just can't do it in the meantime. That's everybody. We're coming to Yom Kippur in a, in a couple of months, right? How many things are you going to clap your, clap your chest for on Yom Kippur that you've been clapping over the last five years? Every year, same thing. Everybody's uh, in process, and I'll get to it, and I hope I'll improve. Uh huh. Like less and horror, and other than wasting time, and 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 uh, you know uh, other things. So, so so she's in process at one level, and everybody else in process at another level. I wouldn't see that necessarily. A lot more work goes into marriage than just that question. I wouldn't see that as what we call an equal. It would something that should uh, be a, an absolute roadblock. 
because everybody's in, the, uh, in, in that situation of hopefully wanting to grow and wanting to improve and knowing there are areas that need work that aren't, that aren't perfect, you know. How many mistakes do you make on Shabbos? Well, when's the last time you went through the whole Shulchan Aruch on Hilchel Shabbos, right? Never? Really? That for sure you're being Mechal Shabbos, no question about it. So, uh, you know, well, what about that, you know? Get on the ball by next week. <laughs> So I, I, I wouldn't say that that, that, that would be, no. Um, and I think, by the way, even more that you'll find this, you'll find this in marriage, that you're not on the same page with respect to everything, and you have to be prepared for that. And you have to, you have, to have an understanding between you that, that this is likely to happen, and because it's likely to happen, and you'll grow at different rates, there has to be flexibility. There'll be commitment for each of you to support the other in developing in the best possible way. Because you love each other, because you want each other to have the best possible, this is part of that, part of that commitment. So no, I would not say it's a, an absolute bar for, uh, for, for doing that. Yeah. Um, say you have a person who goes down a path of addiction. Addiction? Addiction. Yeah. And, or, or that's just an, an ex uh, example. And he spends a few years uh, battling his addiction. And in the course of that, he has to develop let's say, a tremendous uh, psychological insight into himself. And then he gets to a place where he's free of his addiction. Um, a tzaddik who never went down that path, is he missing something because he, he didn't gain a certain understanding of himself? And the specific, the specific, the specific uh, case that I'm referencing is uh, nowadays of use of technology. So I've heard it said that if, let's say, you don't have a smartphone and only have a kosher phone, you get all the credit as a person who has it and has to fight it and all that. You get all the credit. But maybe you're missing some of the uh, personality development elements of having to overcome that. OK, there are a few questions here. The question was, if, if a person uh, has an addiction and overcomes it, and has to struggle to do so, whether he gets a certain spiritual credit, a certain spiritual accomplishment that someone who never had the addiction doesn't get. Um, then the question was, uh, some people have said that if you, if you never had a smartphone, then you will have all the credit of someone who had the smartphone and was addicted and then over, and overcame it. Uh, because you never had it, but then uh, that would contradict the thought that, that, we, that we started with, that you're missing out on some kind of spiritual development. Um, I think that this kind of discussion is, is um, off the page. Um, I, I don't necessarily mean spiritual credit in terms of God's reward and punishment. I mean more the personality development. Personality and development, and yeah. And I, I, I think the whole discussion is off the page. That this discussion is being stated the only, the only, the only, the only mouth out of which the answers to your question could come is the mouth of the Creator. People are different. Their souls are different. Their challenges are different. What they're supposed to accomplish is different. And the fact that he went through these, this particular process and he didn't may mean no loss whatsoever for the other, the second one. None at all. Not behind in any jail or tittle. Nothing because that wasn't his, his path. That wasn't what he was supposed to accomplish. The fact that he has X and he doesn't have X, so what? It's like saying that if I'm not a Kohen, so I've lost out because Kohen has more mitzvos, he has more challenges, more things that he accomplishes. <laughs> My neshama was put into an identity of a non-Kohen. I'm not handicapped. I'm not gonna get less or be less or develop less or, or accomplish less than, than a Kohen. It's just, just, not, just not correct. Own, Kodesh Baruch Hu chose different, uh, created neshamas with different <coughs> qualities, put them in different contexts, and that context is the right context for that neshama to develop everything it needs to develop. Even if this, this one has something that, that one doesn't have, but this one doesn't need it. So if it doesn't need it, he's not lost anything. I, I don't think uh, interpersonal comparisons like that are, are totally, uh, totally um, out of place. I want to elaborate just a little bit on this. I mean, this is the Ramchal in several places. Um, that the, the, the task of, of achieving human perfection has been split up. Adam, Adam and Chava is a pair. 
I had it to, and could have done it in there by themselves. Since it has been split up into millions and billions of different slices, and each person has a, has a slice, and uh, some of the circumstances of life are dictated by the particular challenge that you are facing, a particular slice of, uh, of human perfection that you're supposed to develop under those very specific conditions. And therefore, some of the reason for your condition in life is the specific challenge you were created for. Listen carefully. Let's suppose someone is created to face the challenge of sickness. That's what he's created for. Then he's sick and he's suffering through no guilt whatsoever. No failure whatsoever. He could be an entirely perfect tzaddik and he'll be sick. Because sickness is what he was created to deal with. Was created to, to, which means that the problem of tzaddik viralo, the problem that the righteous person is suffering, in the Ramachal's context, can't be raised. It can't be raised. Because what are you going to tell me? He's a perfect tzaddik and he's suffering. So what? You don't know that that isn't his challenge from the, from the Kodesh Baruch Ramachal says no one can know that. That's something that's, that's in the level of the, of the Kabbalah. It's something that's out of, out of touch, out of ability. To, so you'll never know that. You can't even raise the problem. So it, it, I've been studying this for a long time. Recently it came to me in talking about Tzadik Varalo, because I'm working on the book, book of Job. Uh, given this assumption, you could never raise the question. Job himself couldn't raise the question, because maybe this is what I was chosen to deal with, and, and, and had nothing to do with my guilt. Guilt doesn't come into the picture. So this is an entirely different picture. Yeah. Actually, um, maybe even on the point, I was going to mention tikkun. And um, so through suffering, like, should you always try? Is your tikkun, the suffering, lead you to tikkun always? Like, is that what you should be trying to repair in the world no matter what, whatever you went through and overcame or are struggling with? Or is it maybe just for just you, you know, like, trying to. Oh, I see. The suffering for the sake of the tikkun of the world or just for you? If you're Jewish, the two are linked. You can't separate them that way. Your job is to participate in perfecting the world. You have the, the list of Tariyag Mitzvot, 630 commandments, is your access to perfecting the world. And if you work on some aspect of your own spirituality, because you're Jewish, that's going to contribute to the perfection of the world. You can't separate them. A non-Jew, because he doesn't have 613 commandments, says the Ramchal, um, is his, his mitzvahs affect his own spirituality. It doesn't go further than that. But for a Jew, that's not true. You may not see the connections, but you have to know that that's what's going on. Yes, somebody in the back, huh? Yes. Uh, so in, in the Amida, there's a bracha for, uh, for props and for Hashem. To give us a good year in terms of that, and and there's a there's I don't, I don't really know how to say it in Hebrew, but there's like the phrase and give a blessing, and then and then you say and give a rain and dew for a blessing, and you say the you say the phrase uh, and give a blessing from Pesach until December fourth, but or December fifth if it's like the year before the belief leap year, but then in Israel like you say you, you switch from and give a blessing on like on. Uh, the seventh of uh, Heshvan. So, is there like a reason why it's well, why it's different in, in that term? Because they decided, to, like to me, December fourth seems like a random day. Like you know, it's not like a Jewish holiday, or it's not like you know the Jewish calendar at all. It's just a simple, just a leap year day, like a, just a day in the calendar. Let me let me see. Um, yeah, I you yeah, I know, I know. I'm just I'm just trying to think now. No, it's, it's, the, it's based on a certain astronomical feature. Uh, if I remember exactly what the astronomical feature is. Um, <laughs> we wait in Israel to ask for rain so there'll be enough time for people who came up to the temple will get back to the place uh, so they have to travel in the mud usually thinking of them getting to, to Babylonia. Now, why do, in, outside the land of Israel, they wait until December 4th? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. But it is something in the calendar. It's not, uh, not, a, not a holiday or anything like that, but it's something in the calendar. But, uh, 
I don't remember. You remind me again, I'll, 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 I'll look it up and I'll, and I'll, I'll try to find it for you. Yeah, who else is on, on tap? Yeah. So Hashem gave every uh, Jew, or every person, let's say, a gift, like a talent. Are we meant to pursue that? Or is it just something extra that He gave us? Oh, so this is a very good question. People, I hear this from people all the time. If God gave you a talent, or gave you an ability, you're meant to develop it. No. Some talents that you have may be, uh, serve the purpose of a distraction you have to ignore. Mm. Or there may be a challenge to find a way to use that talent other than the natural way to use it because it may be destructive. Let's suppose that you could be the next Golden Gloves welterweight champion. <laughs> I somehow don't think that you should go after that. You know, I have a, I, as a fellow, I, a fellow became from, I was becoming an ophthalmologist. He called me up one day and he said, I, I have to tell you something. I have to admit it to you. I'm, I'm, I feel terrible about it. I hope you won't think badly about, uh, of me. I said, what was it? He said, well, when I went into ophthalmology, my goal was to win the Nobel Prize in medicine. But I got married and I have one children. We're expecting a second child. And I feel that in order to be a good parent, father to my children, I should know more Torah be able to teach them, give an example to them, and so on and so on. So I've given up my goal of winning the Nobel Prize in ophthalmology. Don't hope you don't feel badly about me. <laughs> Let's say it's like a practical gift, like uh, playing an instrument, or doing art, or speaking, or, you know, yeah, not necessarily I, like uh, playing sports or something like that. Well, if it's, if it's a, a practical uh, talent like that, um, I, I can identify, because I was a musician for many years. Um, I think what you have to do, what happened to me, is I got to a certain point where I said, well, there are five things I like to do, but I want to do some of them well. And if I want to do these well, two of them well, the other three will, will rob that from me. So at a certain point I have to say, I enjoyed doing it, I still benefit from the experience of having done it, but my, I don't have enough talent and energy and time to develop them all. And then be thankful that you're making these choices as opposed to a person who has only one thing he can do, he can't make any choices at all. <coughs> uh, and the fact that you have a talent wouldn't uh, necessarily mean that you should develop it as your profession and not even necessarily as uh, something which you continue to do. I know that if I didn't practice my instrument an hour a day, I, would be, I wouldn't be any good. I couldn't afford an hour a day every day for that activity. I was involved in too many other things that demanded my time. Well, you have to make a, 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 an intelligent decision of priorities, what's more important, and simply say, this was, it served a purpose for a, for a period of time, and now it no longer serves a purpose. Yeah. Well, it depends on what, what kind of thing it is. I mean, is it a pleasure? Is it money? Is it, is it an opportunity for work? Is it... Say someone hurting your feelings. Oh, to, I see, too. Uh, to pass up responding to something with, where you've been compromised. Was somebody hurting your feelings or whatever it is. Um, I say two things. First of all, you want to have the other person's best interests at heart. So if you're going to respond in such a way as to make it worse, that's a very good reason not to respond. Um, and number two, um, there's a sense of what you do has an impact on on who you are, who you think you who you think you are, your own self-evaluation. And it's very, very tricky. Um, sometimes you see a person in a minion who's doing something different from everybody else. Dobbins are longer than everybody else, or louder than everybody else, or uh, wears, you know, everybody was just one way, just a different way. That's not trivial, because he knows he's different. Now, there are only two possibilities. One is that he's right and they're wrong, or they're right and he's wrong. Chances are, in his mind, he's thinking, this is the way it should be done, that's why I'm doing it, why would I do it? And, uh, and that means I'm better and they're worse. The ego implications can be very destructive. So when you answer back, if there's 
self-justification and self-righteousness and condemnation of the other person. That's what's being reinforced in you when you react that way. That's not good. That's not good. That's hard to avoid that. So ignoring it is uh, something which can be very, very virtuous. Now, if th there's a danger that he'll simply continue to do it, either out of malevolence, you know, premeditated bad motivation, or out of sloppiness, then you might think about what kind of response could possibly benefit him and, and benefit his behavior. I suggest, and I'm not, you should ask other people this question, I'm not uh, any more expert than anybody else in this, I suggest say to the person, I would like to tell you that what you're doing hurts me. Softly, that's all. And then if it goes and happens again, you say again, I want you to know that what you're doing is hurting me. Most people hear that a few times. Do you really want to think of yourself as the kind of person who goes around hurting other people? And if he gets really desperate, then you can say it a little bit louder so other people can hear. Don't say it to him, but say it a little bit louder so other people can hear. That's a gentle way of trying to cause him to rethink. What am I really doing here? Why am I doing it? <coughs> that, that might be something to do. But most of the time, uh, the Gemara promises great consideration. I'm going to call Baruch Hu by being about, by giving up on that kind of response. Even what the other person did was wrong because the criterion is not, the, the criterion is not, did he do something wrong? The criterion is, will my response be productive in a way that the Kodesh Baruch Hu wants? That's the question that has to be answered. Usually, especially when you're upset, uh, the answer to that question is no. Okay.